Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ask the Expert. I'm Sergey Gordeev, and our guest today is Elizabeth Sullivan. She is a success coach and a wellness mentor. You've met her last time um, when we talked about general well-being for dancers, but today we're going to dive in deep. How can you use her approach to dance training to get real results? She developed something she calls Building a Better Dancer, and today we're going to talk exactly about what that means. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Sergey. Welcome back. Thank you. It's nice to be back. So, what is Building a Better Dancer? Well, it's actually the name of a talk that I created, um, but the better dancer part is um, addressing a way of thinking. Um, it came out of my experience coaching dancers. I kind of recognized a pattern. Um, they all come to me for different reasons, but at the root of those reasons is this understanding of who they are as dancers and what the dance uh, culture kind of expects of them. And they often feel that they are they're kind of taking on this role of being a passive recipient of information. They feel like their training is happening to them, and they don't really feel like they have a lot of um, agency in their dancing. So the better dancer mentality was an idea that I created to help dancers change the way that they think about themselves, and it challenges them to imagine themselves as active participants in their training. So taking responsibility for the aspects of their training that are within their control, and also thinking of themselves as collaborators in the studios with their teachers, which is very different come from this uh, traditional kind of mentality or mindset. So that's where it comes from. Very different. And actually, um, let's talk about, well, building a better dancer, better than what? What are we juxtaposing here? Right, right. Uh, it's a little tricky because if you, if you look at traditional or old school dancers, I mean, they're beautiful dancers. There's nothing wrong with them as dancers. Um, I think that what I'm really interested in and what I'm challenging is the way that dancers have been maybe conditioned or thought to taught to think about themselves. So the old model um, or kind of the traditional old school mentality is that dancers are, um, you know, they're taught to be obedient, very quiet, um, to kind of wait for information to come to them, not to take a very active approach to their dancing. And although that produce, still can produce very good technical results and art, artistic results, sometimes it produces not very happy people. And so what I've found is that when dancers um, feel like they have a really active role to play in their training and they feel very um, empowered in ways that, you know, they, they just feel like they can get more out of their day-to-day -day experience, they're just happier and they feel like they can go for things a bit more. So that's kind of what, and of course in the, in the traditional model, you know, dancers and certainly ballet culture is known for producing some pretty extreme behaviors in order to become these amazing dancers. So in the past, you know, ballet dancers didn't get married, they didn't have children during their careers, they didn't continue their education because it just wasn't part of the training model. And today's dancers do, right? I mean, we see pictures of them on Instagram, they're pregnant, you know, they're doing pirouettes and they're pregnant. They go to school and get college degrees while they're still dancing professionally. So the, the reality of being a professional dancer today is quite different from what it was traditionally. And in my mind, that requires, you know, new tools, new ways of thinking about yourself as a dancer that are just a little different. Also, just like the idea of taking care of yourself. Somehow, you know, it's hard to imagine, you know, a 20th century ballerina basically all about taking care of herself. And like, because the, the, the thinking, well, traditionally, as you pointed out, has been that you, you put your entire life into it and you, you sacrifice. It's a, it's, a, it's a life of hardship. It's a life of heartbreak and, and, and sacrifice. Um, you're proposing something different. Yes. <laughs> um, I... I, I experience both training models. I experience that kind of, it's blood, sweat, and tears. Yes, like, it's blood, sweat, and tears. It's everything you are. You need to watch videos 24-7. You need to, to live and breathe and eat and sleep ballet. Um, that didn't make me particularly happy. That never worked for me. And it never worked for a lot of the people that I danced with. We all kind of secretively on the side were trying to become more well-rounded people because it made us better dancers and it made us happier. Um, so, yeah, I'm proposing that, and I don't think this is, terribly radical really if you look at the dancers today, if you follow dancers on Instagram, if you, you listen to them in interviews, they are well-rounded. They're, they're, they're aspiring to be educated, to be thoughtful about what they put into their bodies, to cross-train when it's necessary, to seek counseling and you know help in areas where they feel like they need that. And I think ultimately it produces 
you know, a happier individual, a person who can have a longer career, not burn out so fast. So this is, this really, I, I know this is going to resonate with a lot of of viewers out there who are struggling and wondering is does it have to be this hard? <laughs> uh, so let's talk about it being hard because uh, there are two different types of dancers, you know, generally. Dancers who, and, and, and these groups um, can be separated by their goal. So uh, some dancers are professional track dancers, some dancers are dancing for recreation and wellness and just general enrichment of their lives, enjoying the art form. Uh, talk about these two groups and how these two different groups might use your approach to get their results. Right. So I think that the main difference in terms of my work and the Better Dancer mentality is the set of expectations that those two different groups are up against. So if you're dancing recreationally, of course your body still is being trained to do things that no normal human being is going to be trained to do. So in that sense, it's the technical training is the same. It's still very difficult to find your turnout and to you know, find your extension and to execute on the technical, you know, aspects of classical ballet. But the kind, the rigorous um, expectations for what you're supposed to look like, how high those legs are supposed to go, how many pirouettes you're supposed to do, they're just not, it's just not the same because you're not putting yourself in an arena where people are going to be judging you and looking for those things. So in that sense, a more recreational track should relieve a bit of that pressure that you know you're working really for yourself and for your own enjoyment not not for fun that you don't take it seriously but you're not going to be judged against people who are moving in that professional track now those dancers are being measured against the set of expectations that professionals have so it's a very it's a very rigidly defined set of expectations, and so they do have to sort of be aware of that and kind of know what they're getting into. So this is important because I think a lot of the pressure can be relieved right away if a dancer does uh, some deep soul searching and understands that, that there are generally you know, two tracks. Are you, and so you then choose. You, you don't subject yourself, but you actively yourself choose which set of expectations to measure yourself up against and that you will be measured up against. So I think uh, many dancers out there believe that they want to, you know, be um, a professional ballerina, but really if they objectively look at a ballet company that they want to go into and they see that this is a certain type of dancer and they're just not that type of dancer, re realizing that early on, I, I, we were talking earlier about this, will help that dancer already by not subjecting themselves to a set of standards they just can't meet, right? Like, yeah. Because you talked about awareness. I think awareness is important. I think this is part of the responsibility aspect of the building a better dancer mentality, right? Is that you, you want to, you don't want to live in a vacuum, you don't want to live in a fantasy world, you want to understand what the expectations are of you. And, but I also think that training at any level, whether it's pre-professional or recreational, should be about enriching an individual's life, right? It should be about teaching them things that they wouldn't otherwise, you know, acquire in other arenas. And ballet education is very, has very specific gifts to give, right, and tools to teach. And so I think in both environments it would be a mistake to ever kind of shift into that old model, which is we must break you in order to make you. You know, I don't, right. I don't subscribe to that at all in, in either track, but I do think that there is a personal responsibility in the dancer to kind of recognize you know, first of all, you know, do that soul searching and figure out which, what you really want. Now, there are always dancers who will defy the expectations of the art form, right? There was a time when, you know, teeny tiny dancers weren't really a thing. You know, everyone was hiring long, tall, leggy ballerinas. And then, you know, you have a dancer come in who just, just defies everyone's expectations and is teeny tiny. And all of a sudden, teeny tiny dancers are in, you know, by which I mean short in stature. Um, so there are always kind of outliers that will kind of break through the expectations that the profession has set and that the culture would consider um, normal for a, a ballet dancer. But I think for the most part, yeah, there's, there's a, pretty, a pretty rigid set of expectations. And I would also say that in, in realizing that you may not meet those, it doesn't mean that you can't dance or be a dancer or be deeply in love with dance and carry on that love affair for the rest of your life. Right, there are different forms of dance, there are different areas of dance, there are things you can work in, you know, development, you can work in arts administration, you can do all kinds of things in the field that don't require having to put on a tutu or having to put on, you know, a, a, 
a set of a, a costume and be a prince on stage, right? Right, and and this is an important thing I think for dancers to realize because um, a lot of them just doing that research and and and, and realizing that a you know if you want to be a dancer, there are, there's a wide range of different types of dancers. You know, there are contemporary dance companies. There are, there are classical ballet companies that only have classical repertoire, though, although there are fewer and fewer of those. You know, there, there, are, there's few, there are fusion companies, and there are different types of, you know, there's a range within the world of dance. But also, the world of dance offers other opportunities. You know, maybe you want to be a casting director. If you love to be surrounded by ballerinas, be a casting director for ballerinas, or be an agent, be, you know, be whatever you wish to be. Just know the, the wide range of opportunities that are out there for you. Because I think if we talk about empowering, that's one thing that empowers, knowing your choices, right? Right. Um, let's talk about the professional track uh, uh, ballet dancers, um, uh, both male and female, who, um, for whom it's harder to, because, they, you know, it's harder to adopt this better dancer mentality because they are subjected to a very harsh set of rules and and so better dancer mentality does not cancel the rules, right? No, <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't. What it does is it it invites the dancer to um, to adopt a new approach to how they view their process. It's a very it's it's an invitation to change internally the way that they think about themselves. It doesn't change the ballet world. It doesn't change any of the external. Um, <coughs> expectations or perceptions. What it does is it invites them to go inside and say, when I go into this class and I get these corrections, how do I think about those? You know, how do I think about the feedback that I get? How do I, uh, rather than kind of sit back and wait for information to come at me, how do I go into class with a set of goals and a set of objectives that I'm going to work on? And what that does is it sounds very subtle, but in fact, it, it, it builds a sense of confidence and a sense of self in each individual dancer that serves them really well, even as they go through their professional training. In fact, even more so, because they're facing these expectations, they need to build themselves up from the inside to understand wh what's my responsibility. Well, like you, know? you were saying, it's a, it's a collaboration. So both parties, the, the, the teacher and the trainee, have to come to the process bringing something in, not just sitting back and letting the other one, you know, sort of co completely right. take over the process. And that, that's what happens a lot. Now, some dancers, you know, take it to the other extreme. They come in and say, well, nobody will tell me what to do, and, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to celebrate myself, and I'm going to celebrate my body the way I <laughs> want to. Just talk about to, to that a little bit. Um, yeah, some, sometimes that can happen. I mean, I think in my personal experience, there are... Very young dancers often are, you know, they just have more confidence. They haven't hit those years where they start to question themselves and experience self-doubt. And so one of the, the things that... Is good. Right. But one of the things that I find extremely refreshing in working with very young dancers is that they don't have any negative self-talk. They don't experience negative self-talk. Because they go in and they imagine that they can do everything. And so that serves them in such a wonderful way because, the, as you mentioned, the mind-body connection, the more you think you can do something, the more likely you are to be able to do it. And so they do go in with that wonderful sense of like self and ability to kind of do anything. They just have to work hard. Um, and I, as, they, as dancers get older and they kind of are subjected to more judgment and they just go through, you know, the natural stages of getting older where you start to question yourself, that's when a lot of times that confidence and that ability to think positively about outcomes gets chipped away at. So, um, but, but, but the whole thing of, you know, the teacher still knows best. That's why you come to the teacher, right? Like, absolutely. So balancing that confidence absolutely. with, because sometimes, you know, I've seen this happen, dancers take it to an extreme where they won't be told what to do. And then the dancer, right. the, the, the teacher doesn't, you know, is not quite able to help them now. So it doesn't right. cancel respect for the teacher. No, it doesn't cancel no, 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 the no. expectations right. that you'll be measured against if you're auditioning for the company. You still have no. to get those results. Absolutely, absolutely. This is an internal process. It's really an internal process. It's a way of, if you are a person who um, is insecure, if you're a dancer who just is always saying, like, you know, I'll ask a dancer, you know, what's going well for you? Like, what's going well in your training? Oh, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I don't know. 
you have to know. That's your responsibility, right? You have to be able to say, okay, here, these are the areas of weakness. I'll, and then I'll say, what's, what's a weak area of weakness? Oh, well, blah, blah, blah. I mean, they can talk for days about what's wrong with their dancing and what's wrong with their bodies, but they can't access the things that are going well and the things that are good. And they need to be able to because that's what you build, that's what you build your foundations of confidence on that will carry you through those, those tough moments in your repertoire or that will take you through the audition and allow you to have enough confidence in yourself and enough belief in, your, in the fact that you have something to give that makes you stand in the front of the room for at least one combination so that you can be seen, right? I mean, that's, I think there are those outliers who sort of think that they're, you know, amazing and they're fantastic um, and that's tricky I mean to be to be very honest with you personally I haven't worked with anybody like that and I think that that's not surprising right because the kinds of dancers who are who want support are the ones who don't identify as the I'm fantastic right they're saying I think I have some weaknesses and I think I need some work um, none of this mentality none of this way of thinking about your work cancels out the fact that the teachers are teachers for a reason. They're at the front of the room because they know more than you do and they have experience and things to share with you. And doesn't cancel out the fact that the, that the profession and the field in general, the art form, has a set of expectations that is there. And you're sort of, you're expected to, you know, to follow those, to try to meet those expectations if this is what you want to do as a career. In some fancied future, is ballet going to change and have a very different look in a different, maybe, yeah. But it doesn't mean going sort of the other direction and saying, I know better than my teacher and nobody will tell me what to do, because uh, that might be taken that way also by some dancers. Sure. And actually, we've seen those dancers and, and we've seen them not succeed. Sure, sure. I mean, I think we're, I think taken to an extreme um, you know, that could be not a positive thing. So the, dan the building a better dancer mentality is, is about sort of, you know, doing your best within the confines of the environment that you're in. And so, of course, the teacher, the teacher still knows best. She's at the front of the room for a reason. Um, the expectations that are already there by the field and the companies that you're auditioning for are set. And so what we're working on is trying to get dancers to, you know, think more positively about what is their responsibility towards their training and the collaboration with their teacher within the confines of, within the role of the, the expectations of the Right, because, because at the end of the day, you still come to the audition and you'll be picked based on those results Absolutely. that your teacher is trying to get you to achieve. You know? Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and something else you said that's very important, you said that it's important to know what you did well, because that only by analyzing what you do and knowing, you know, Everybody works on corrections, of course, because those are the things they need to be corrected and paid attention to. But unless you analyze your successes, there'll be accidents. You won't be able to replicate them. But exactly. to replicate them, you have to know what you did well so you can do it again. You could be a coach, because I say that to my dancers all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, and, and it's an it's important true. point. It shouldn't be an accident. Your successes should not be accidents. You should know why they happened and be able to duplicate them again, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and you uh, said that you have examples of people who kind of thought this almost like an entitled kind of like, well, I'm the one who knows best, but, but they've, they've shifted and achieved results that way. Talk about that. Yeah, I'll give you a quick example. I'm gonna call this dancer Olivia. Um, okay. she, uh, she, was, she's been she had been training at the same school for her whole um, training period. She, every year she would go up in the casting for her Nutcracker production and she was expecting to be the sugar plum in her final year in the school, and that did not happen for her. And her initial feelings of disappointment and anger, and, and you know, I should have gotten it, I was in line to get it, were really not serving her. And so when I had her imagine a different outcome using, you know, what's your responsibility in this, she was able to go into the school in September with a big smile on her face about getting to do Snow Queen again because she was going to do it even better. She brought such a good energy and a positive response to that that not only was she invited to understudy the Sugar Plum, but she actually ended up performing it in the end. So if she hadn't been able to get a hold of those feelings of I should have been given or it was my turn or I deserve all or of I those deserve, things. Or any we... of those things that are nat they're natural feelings, but they're not useful. They wouldn't have served her. She would never have been asked to. If she'd gone in with that attitude, she never would have been the understudy. And she wouldn't have had the opportunity to 
do the role and she did do the role and she did a beautiful job in the role and then ended up having a fantastic audition season that winter. So, I mean, that's, those are the kinds of things that can happen when a dancer accepts responsibility for their own part in what's going on in their training and then really, you know, tries to make a shift for the better in the way that they're thinking about things. So, so good, good energy is important and it translates on stage and it will serve you in casting and you know as you go up for different roles it'll serve you in your training so that you can process you know the information that you're given better so so good energy and good attitude is key isn't it oh absolutely absolutely those are the things that make being an active participant fun right yeah. if you're a passive recipient and you're negative and you're kind of suspicious and you're not so sure it's very hard to want to teach somebody like that and it's very hard to want to you know employ someone like that so having that sense of you know excitement and having something to give in the studio and something to share with an audience i mean that's what people want to see on stage you know they want to see that energy and you also talked about uh, receiving even the constructive criticism as a gift so mm -hmm. if you really shift your perception and treat everything that comes into you, into your life as a dancer and as a human being as a gift, then, then it's easy to, to, to have that positive attitude and energy and good results, right? They have better results. All, the, all my dancers that use the better dancer mentality that really think, that try to shift their ways of thinking, they have better results. They're happier in the studio. They're more independent too in terms of, think, of their ways of thinking. I can actually continue to progress and do well even if today I didn't get a correction, right? That doesn't mean my, my class is over, my career is over. They're like, okay, that's fine. I'm gonna work on, I know what I need to work on. And that's, that's a very empowering place to be for them. Well, last time we asked you to address your teenage self. We asked all our guests to do that. Uh, is there anything you forgot to say to your teenage <laughs> self? Uh, and this is your chance to do it right there in that camera. Hello again, teenage self. Um, I would say that as a personality, you are a fearless person. And what I think about when I go back in time is I wonder why you didn't dance without fear. And so I would say that to my teenage self, be as bold in your dancing and in your studio habits as you are in your heart and as you are in the rest of your life. Because in the end, it will make you stand out for a good reason. Our guest today was Elizabeth Sullivan. She is a success coach and a wellness mentor. I'm Sergey Gordeev, and we'll see you next time on Ask the Expert.